Greetings. Uh, my name is Pastor Al Cooper, and I just want to welcome you again to another uh, evening of Grace Online. But before we get started, I'd just like to uh, just start us off, off with a little word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we just thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your word. We know that your word comes to uh, not only to correct us, but it also gives us an insight on how you want us to live, how we can please you. Father, I pray that you word my mouth and that I not speak in error tonight, but I just only uh, express your words the way you want them to respect them so your people can uh, have a feel for who you are and be have an intimate relationship with you. So, Father, we just thank you again for your word. We thank you for, your, for this life. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for your son. We thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives throughout in this restoration process. We thank you. We give you love and we give you glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank God. Amen. As I said, my name is Pastor Al Cooper, and uh, I just want to welcome you again to uh, another evening of uh, Grace Online. And uh, we're in the midst right now of a five-week series of, and we're discussing our kingdom culture codes. Tonight, my particular code will be kingdom commitment. And to start off, I just want to give us a running definition of commitment and what that word commitment actually defined as. As a noun, it's the state or quality of being dedicated to a cause, an activity, a relationship, or et cetera. The second uh, definition would be an engagement or an obligation that restricts freedom of action. You know, when I, when I think about that word commitment and I start thinking about today's church or how, how um, believers or Christians see church, when they hear the word commitment, it, it, it's strange to them because when they see themselves as serving in church, they think it's voluntary. You know, nobody wants to say I'm committed to a church because if you start uh, having people do too much work, they end up going to another church. They say they always have options. But they have to understand that being committed, and you can just look at the numbers. When you think about being committed, it, it's serving God. It's not you serving people. You're not serving a building. So when you look at the statistics about how believers in most churches, I say 85% of the churches, there's 20% of the people that's doing 80% of the work. And those aren't made up statistics. Those are statistics because people really truly believe that they are volunteer when it comes to church. They figure if you're not paying them, if you're not, if they, there's got to be something tangible that they're getting out of it. So when you look at the word commitment, it, it's slightly different when you start talking about the kingdom commitment. And so today, we, tonight, we want to make sure that we understand that we're talking about kingdom commitment because we can't just look at the world and assume that's what commitment looks like. Even in our marriages, you have people uh, married three or four times. Uh, so there's no commitment because we see the world seeing things that I got options. But see, in the kingdom, we don't have options because we're either part of the kingdom or we're not. So let's look at um, uh, kingdom, kingdom commitment. We're going to take a closer look at it. Many times in Scripture, the commitment of God's people was intensely challenged when facing hardships in adversity. What is committed within a relationship or a goal, God promises to provide endurance and strength. Although commitment to our beliefs, goals, or our marriages may be very difficult at times, the outcome is always rewarding. There are numerous references in the Bible addressing the Christian commitment in various aspects of life, to our families, to our neighbors, to our employers, to church, and our health. In all these things we do say, and the first scripture I want to take a look at is Ephesians 6 and 5. Ephesians 6 and 5. Ephesians 6 and 5 said, Obeying your earthly masters with respect and fear, with the sincerity of heart, just as you would Christ. So in other words, what Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus is that you have to have a respect, and you have to understand that there's a structure when it comes to authority. You have to align yourself with that structure in order for that business or for that church to function properly. So you have to be committed in understanding that there is a respect and there's a reverence for structure. You have to be in line to understand what structure is and you have to be committed. And he also says in this same verse, he says, 
with sincerity of heart, meaning it has to be heartfelt, because if you're not passionate about what you're doing, if you're not passionate about being committed to God, then it's not going to last because you're going to burn out really fast in anything, relationships, your job. If you're not passionate about that job, if you're not passionate about that relationship, you will burn out and your commitment will finally show. So he's saying that, that's those, the first two he says in Ephesians. He says, you f- and secondly, and the last one is that you have to do it as if you're doing it for Christ. In our relationships, we have to understand that even in a love relationship, the only way we can love someone in our relationship, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a mother, whether it's a child, we have to first feel the love of God because our love is something that we give away. Love is not something that we receive. We, we only love because God first loved us to recognize that intimacy. So there's commitment to understanding that you have to first align yourself with God so you can give that love out. The, love can't get, the world can't give you love. Only God can give you love, only God can give you peace, and only God can give you joy. If you go out looking for it in any other places, you, your commitment is, is, is misaligned and you won't get it. And your relationships will always fail, you never keep a job, and you won't be a good church member. That's the first scripture that we looked at. The second scripture comes from Hebrews 10 and 25. And these I'm paraphrasing a little bit. It says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another. In other words, when a lot of times when you see this scripture in Hebrew, the first thing people say is that the pastor trying to get me to come to church. So, you know, don't forsake, it, don't forsake yourself for gathering with others. But, you know, being committed, it actually is God saying, look, this is your protection. See, there's power in numbers. See, if I fall short, my brother can pick me up. So it's not just a gathering at church. It's, it's, it's being a part of something where when you're going through some things, there's, pe- there's people to help you. You got that protection because there's a scripture where it says the devil goes around like a roaring lion, seeing that who he can devour. See, the first thing, the ones that he captures are the ones that's isolated. He always catches them by himself. So when you're isolated, there's three D's that will always show up to somebody who wants to isolate themselves. First D is discouragement. Discouragement is, is, the, is one of the vital parts where people are feeling like their self-esteem is gone. They're discouraged, so they want to isolate. The second D is doubt. Doubt always scares people because they don't know what tomorrow brings. So if the devil can get you isolated, he can easily capture you. And the third D is depression which really sinks in bad. So there are three Ds that people are, that isolate themselves uh, will, 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 are going through. Discouragement, doubt, and depression. And those, what make, those are the things that make you vulnerable to Satan devices. That's why it's so important to gather with people. That's why it's so to be around like minds. You have to be committed to understand that you're in safety. Nobody's trying to make you do something you don't want to do when they say to give you the word commitment. But there, God has put you in a place where you have, there's, there's so much power in numbers. Two can put a thousand to flight. So that, that's one of the things we have to do when we look at this scripture. So don't ever think when, when the, the pastor or, or, or an elder or someone comes to you and said, why aren't you been showing up at church? Because they're worried about your soul. They're worried about you getting isolated and that you were so easily overtaken when we're isolated. And the third scripture that we're looking at here in my uh, intro uh, is 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19, and also again, verse 31. Now, this talks about the body. Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. See, there's even a commitment to your body because the body doesn't belong to you anymore. Christ died for that. He paid the price for you. So your life now is living serving Christ. You are a servant of Christ now. So you just can't put anything in this temple. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. And so you are responsible. You're committed to making sure that you you work out. You don't drink. You don't smoke. You don't do anything that's going to damage this temple because God is in need of you. You have to be healthy to go out and witness. You have to be healthy. You when people look at you and they don't see healthy, then they say, whoa. And I don't, I'm not just talking about, you know, if you, if you malnutrition. I'm just talking about a healthy mindset. 
You know, I'm talking about somebody who, who's always talking positive, not always talking down. So there's, there's so many ways that you have, you can show sickness without just being thin. You know, you, your mindset can be so off. So you have to also make sure that you understand that your body is not yours. And you are obligated to keep that body in a situation where God can use it. And that's, that's just some of the brief things that we talk about, those first three scriptures. But one of the main scriptures that we want to look at is Matthew 22, verses 37 through 38. Because the Bible also teaches us that the chief commitment of our lives is to God himself. Jesus spoke these words in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 38. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Now, Jesus is telling us a few things here. He's telling us that every five of our being, every faucet of our life, must be committed to loving and serving God. And I'm going to say that again, loving and serving God. What does that even look like? What does that even look like, loving and serving God? This means that we must hold nothing back from Him because He holds nothing back from us. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He was willing to sacrifice His only child, and not many of us were willing to do that. So God gives us everything, so we shouldn't hold anything back from Him. Jesus tells us that our commitment to him must supersede our commitment to any other family member. Now, this is a very, this particular scripture that I'm about to quote is a very controversial scripture because people don't take it into context that it was given. It comes from Luke chapter 14, verses 26 through 27. And this is what it says. It says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. You know, people get so upset when they hear that because they don't understand that he's talking. He's, Jesus wrote and he talked in hyperbolic statements. He was over the top. He overemphasized certain things to draw your attention. So when he says the word hate, he's not talking about a disdain. Uh, I just can't stand to see some. He's just telling you that the commitment has to be so great that when it comes to you choosing your mother or you choosing your wife or you choosing your daughter or you choosing any other relative, you choose God first. You choose God first. And he's not saying that's going to ever happen, but he said if you're faced with that choice, be prepared, be committed enough to understand that that's what it takes. That's what it takes. You know, so many people, even when you look at Judas, who was really smart, uh, a mathematician, he, kept, he was the treasurer for the disciples. He kept all the money. What happened to Judas? His very gift became his curse because he fell in love with money. He sold Christ out for 30 silver pieces that he didn't even get to spend. So, so, so when we see those things, our commitment has to be greater. Our, it has to supersede our own selfish gains. So we have to understand those things. God has to be first. No, our family members, I don't care how much you love them, you have to go with God because God would never steer you wrong. You know, I was talking earlier about the commitment in marriages where you have 65% divorce rate. Come on. You want to take those odds over God? You have to be committed. What makes what God is the third part? He's the third part of the wedding. He's the third part of the three chord string. It can't stay together. You got your husband, and wife, and that third chord has to be God. It won't stay together without it. So He's committed to you. Are you committed to Him? Is the question. So when you think about it, and uh, such commitment means our family relationship may have to be severed. It means our commitment to Christ's man, if given in either or situation, we turn away from them and continue on with Jesus. The bottom line is that those who cannot make that kind of commitment cannot be his disciple. And one of the reasons he says that is because he knows persecution is going to come. He knows there's going to be a test. You know, there's going to be something that's going to happen in your life that's going to touch your faith in him. Jesus, he's given us this warning in advance. The reason for such commitment and loyalty is that the trials we may have to endure will be quite demanding. 
our allegiance to him at all times may be trying and strenuous. John 15 and 20 says, Jesus says to a disciple, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. Second Timothy 3 and 2 says, the apostle Paul spoke these same warnings to the church, to, to young Timothy. He Indeed, he says, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He's not saying if there's persecution. He's saying when there's persecution. Uh, a few minutes ago, we were talking about, you know, uh, family, choosing God over family. So one of the things we have to understand is that when we decide that we want to uh, come to Jesus, if we want to decide we want to get saved, there are going to be some people who ain't going to like our personality after that. There are going to be some people that want to leave us. There's going to be some people who tell us, I know you ain't falling for all that. You know, you, they just want your money at that church. You know, there's a lot of things that you're going to come up against, and that's persecution because you got to either choose to stay there and listen to them or you got to choose to separate yourself from them. So we have to understand that when persecution comes from all anger, it's not just that I can't pay my bills or I just lost my job. We have to love God and understand that even through those things, he's never going to leave us nor forsake us, and he's going to always promise to meet our needs. We have to stand on that faith to understand, and that takes commitment because our family can put pressure on us. Our wives can put pressure on us. Our husbands can put pressure on us. Our children can put pressure on us. Our children do things sometimes that we like, whoa, come on, that ain't my child. That's a demon seed, you know, and we don't like to say that about our kids because what they learn, if we don't put the right thing in them in the house, the, the, the streets will teach them a lot better than we can. So you don't know what's going to come in. So you have to be committed to understand that you have to be all in with Christ. Everything is in because the persecution is going to come and it's going to be a time that you're going to have to really be stressed out that you're going to hold on to what Christ is saying to you. One of the reasons persecution comes. So there's a cause for discipleship. Luke 9 and 23 through 24 says, If anyone comes after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. In essence, what Jesus is saying is that the true cross of commitment to Christ is one total self-denial cross-bearing, and continual following Jesus it means that every morning I get up, there are going to be some desires in my mind, and they, they're going to be all about me. There are going to be some desires. Oh, man, I want this. I want that. Oh, I saw this pretty young lady. Oh, there are desires that's just going to, those thoughts that you don't even solicit just pop up. But you got to kill that flesh. You got to be committed each and every morning to know that there's going to be some things that's only going to benefit you and not the kingdom. So you, you got to be ready for these things. You have to understand that there's a price to pay for being a disciple. And you have to be ready for that commitment. It fully demonstrates, Christ fully demonstrated his love for us when he went to the cross. When he sacrificed his own son's life for the world. And then... One example that, that serves so great that I want to talk about is the life of Apostle Paul. He was an example of commitment and sacrifice and service. Galatians 2 and 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul is saying, you have to understand who Paul was. To get to where he is at this point in his life, you have to understand that Paul was a Pharisee. His job was to hunt down Christians and persecute them. He was a Jew's Jew, meaning his father and mother were both Jews. He was educated by the best theologian of his time, Galilee. So Paul was smart, but he, his whole life was based on hunting down Christians and, and persecuting them. For him to have that transformation took a commitment because not only did he have problem with the Jewish people of his time that he left and, and decided to go follow Christ, he had problem with the Gentiles because they couldn't trust him. 
You're the same Paul that was trying to kill me yesterday. Now you're going to tell me to follow the gospel? So, so just think of that commitment. You're not welcome here and you're not welcome there. So, and you're trying to prove to them that you're with them now. You're, not, you're no longer a Pharisee. You're not longer trying to kill them. But you're the one that's trying to build churches. So Paul, he, he even changed his identity. He went from Paul, from Saul to Paul. He changed it from a Jewish to Roman citizenship so he could kind of blend in, so he could disguise himself. But there were still people who knew who he was. So he still had this commitment that he had to stay with. He was persecuted from both sides. He was always in jail. So Paul had issues where he, he had to be lifted out on a roof. You know, he was shipwrecked. He was beaten so many times, but he stayed with it. So the commitment is there, the life of Apostle Paul. This is one thing on uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 to 8. This is what Paul says. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearance. So Paul, he understood that it was coming to a time where he was telling uh, Brother Timothy, see, we are committed when we know that our end is almost near. We have to bring somebody else up because the gospel has to keep going. So even though he knew he was dying, he was trying to encourage Timothy to keep that same faith. He said, don't, don't change this gospel. Don't water it down for these false prophets. You preach the word in season and out of season. But he was making sure that he didn't just leave everybody hopeless. He left them with hope because he encouraged them to do the work that he had been done because he knew his time was coming. The same Paul in Galatians 6 and 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. He's letting us know right then. He said, yeah, you're going to get tired. This, this commitment to Christ is not something easy. It's not an easy job. So you have to understand that the greater glory is to come. The greater is to come. So God is not going to leave you helpless. He's going to always be there with you. And don't get weary because as soon as you get weary and you start to fade out, you lose contact with the body, and the body is your protection. So he don't, don't get weary. In conclusion, I'd like to say, total commitment to God means that Jesus is our sole authority, our guiding light, our unerring compass. Being committed to Christ means being fruitful. It means being a servant, being, being fruitful. That means we got to be productive. we got to be serving to be productive. We can't just be bystanders. We can't just, there is a, there is a function that we have to do. And only, only each individual has a function to make this body movable, that makes this body uh, productive. So we have to be in our place and we have to be doing our function. We have to also understand that Paul said in Philipp, Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, this is what Paul said. He said, for me to live is Christ." And to die is gain. So he understood no matter if he was in heaven or if he was on earth, Christ was still going to be with him. Whether he lived or whether he died, Christ was his portion. So he had the best of both worlds. Now, one thing about Paul, he loved to preach. Paul loved to preach. He had a passion for preaching. And, 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 and more than anything, he would have, if he had another hundred years on this earth, he would have loved it. But he also understood that no matter where he was at, if he was living or if he was dead, Christ was still going to be with him. He was still going to get that reward. So he didn't want to say, you know, I done got to a certain stage while I'm here, I ain't going to preach no more. No, Paul preached to the end because it was his passion. But he just said, but to die is gain because Christ is still going to be with me no matter where I go. I got the best of both worlds, and I'm content with understanding that. The last verse, and it's to each one of us, and it's in Proverbs from Solomon, the wisest man of his time. Proverbs 16 and 3 says, Commit, commit to the Lord 
whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Commit to the Lord, and he will establish your plans. So what we get from that is that the best chance for us to succeed in the kingdom of God comes when we align our plans with truth. Where do we get truth from? The truth comes from the word of God. That means that those who submit to God's will and seek him are in a better position than those who ignore and reject him. So for us to understand that, we have to really get into the word. We have to be committed to our studies. We have to be committed to being a part of a body. We have to be committed to understand that Christ is our number one authority and we follow through that. Again, I want to thank you for joining us uh, for Grace Online. And I'd like to pray us out before I say my farewell, but let's pray. Oh, gracious Father, we just thank you for this night, Lord. We thank you for your word. We know that there's a commitment, Lord, when it comes to the kingdom of God. And we just have to understand that our culture, even in this world, will tell us that commitment is not something that's lukewarm. But we know that commitment is something that's very passionate and that's very on fire. God wants us to love him. He wants us to be everything to us. So, Father, when he says that, that means that he wants us serving. He wants us being productive. He wants us being fruitful. But most of all, he wants us walking in truth because he knows it's the best thing for us. He knows better than anyone else what's good and what's great. And the best of all, he gives us salvation, and, he, and it's a gift. So, Father, we thank you again for this lesson tonight. We thank you for this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. And amen. And as always, here at Grace, we believe there is 